Well, welcome. My name is Bob Manukin, and I chair the program on negotiation. And I must say, today is a thrill for me because my friend and colleague, I guess I can even claim mentee to some degree, Lynn Norman, uh, is here. And Lynn ha is going to talk to us about her book. You have a copy of the book? Where's the book? Let's hold it up. There you go. I know we have here our current graduate research fellows for the program on negotiation. I want you all to see this. <laughs> this is her uh, dissertation, which she worked on while she was here and completed, and has now uh, produced a book uh, uh, which has been published on Demonization of International Politics A Barrier to Peace in the Israeli Palestinian Conflict. Lynn uh, was it was a great joy to have her here at Harvard as a research fellow. Actually, she stayed here for two years. And during that time, she both worked on her dissertation and she worked with me. And we, we in fact, very substantially through her work, put on a, an interdisciplinary conference with the title Dealing with Evil. And believe it or not, the conference with what timing can only be viewed as somewhat or a little too propitious, occurred uh, the weekend of the uh, marathon bombing, uh, when in fact uh, the first day of the marathon was after the bombing, but when in fact Cambridge was literally shut down because of the wild chase in Watertown uh, with the brothers who were involved in the bombing. Uh, we, in fact, had to reshuffle the conference to make it fit. But the, to the topic was uh, a little bit too uh, uh, current and realistic. Uh, Lynn, in fact, is a real cosmopolitan. Uh, her father's French. Her mother's Norwegian. She was raised in Norway. Uh, she was educated at Oxford and Cambridge. Her undergraduate work was at Cambridge, but her PhD dissertation uh, was at Oxford. And she spent time here at Harvard as a fellow before she came back as a research fellow. She's presently uh, doing research and in residence at the University of California, Davis. And I simply want to say, Lynn, we're so proud of you and we're so thrilled you've come back. And I, you're in, in store for both a, an intellectual treat, but knowing you win, it's going to be a visual <laughs> display that's pretty awesome, too, because what, when I first met her, what blew me away was her collection of visual materials uh, relating to demonization. Lynn, it's all yours. Thank you, Bob, for those, that, those kind words. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, um, it's a real, real pleasure to be back here at, uh, at the Harvard Law School and, in, and visit, you know, PON in general, um, and to see both new and familiar faces. Um, I was, as Bob said, a former scholar here, and, and PON was my intellectual home for, for two years. Um, and this is really, was and is a unique opportunity for scholars to engage with practitioners and academics. Um, and for me, for the thesis, it was just really rewarding. So to be able to come back here and present the work and the book that I've done uh, is, a, is a real, real pleasure. So I'm happy that, um, to see so many faces here today. Uh, what I am going to be presenting uh, is the PhD research that I did on demonization and in international politics. Just as a quick outline, I've, I've divided my presentation into two, as is in the book. The first part is the theoretical underpinnings of demonization in historical context, the political phenomenon, and um, in the context of war and peace, which I examined it. And then the empirical part, which is the case study that I did on Israel and Palestine for this particular um, book, looking at mutual demonization and uh, some of the material that I'd like to share with you from the book. But I would like to begin the presentation with a story. And there are two reasons that I want to start with that story. The first one is uh, that it's a good example of what I mean by demonization. 
But the second reason is I discovered and I came across this example when I was here as a, as a research fellow at PON. I had just met with Bob and he sent me off to say, go and find 100 examples, come back. <laughs> and I was at my desk and um, I came across this article in the New York Times. And it just clicked and I said, that's it, that's the beginning of the thesis, that's the beginning of the book. Um, and so here has, here's how it begins. In April 1998, three artists, um, an Israeli Jew, an Israeli Arab, and a Palestinian, came together to paint a mural. The project was entitled The World Wall, A Vision of the Future Without Fear, and was supposed to stand as a symbol of coexistence for the disputed land. It was a project with noble intentions, but it ended badly. Covering the, the story in an article for the New York Times, Ethan <coughs> Brenner dubbed it the devil incident. The incident had occurred, he explained, when the Jewish artist had painted an angelic figure to represent his people. The Palestinian artist, furious at the depiction of the Israelis of the, as the heroes of the story, uh, announced at, to the audience at the unveiling of the artwork that uh, his colleague's creation was in fact, quote, a devil <coughs> posing in angel's dress like <coughs> the Israelis themselves. And so the reason that I start with this example is that um, even though it's in the artistic world, it, it does really provide a microcosm of the dispute, the, the core kind of widespread contention and hatred that exists in the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians in the disputed land. Um, so what do I mean by demonization then? Well, um, demonization means the act of giving into or, um, or, yeah, the act of changing into or giving the characteristics of a demon. <coughs> by that, there's two senses to the definition. On the one hand, it has um, the, the, the literal transformation of a being into a demon. But in the second sense, it's, it's something that you ascribe to someone. You give them the characteristic of a demon. It's a, it's a metaphor, an externally imposed and symbolic representation of the enemy. Um, but that making someone per se a devil isn't necessarily demonizing, as you can see from the following examples, right? These are totally different contexts where the image of the devil appears, either be it through football, advertisement, you know, tech industry. This isn't really what I mean by demonization. The demonization that I study in the book is more broadly defined as exaggerating the evil of the enemy. So it's a morally imposed judgment on the enemy where you um, define them as evil. And um, in the book what I do is um, I equate, I adapt what I call the anatomy method. And the aim is to do to the phenomenon of demonization uh, in theory what the anatomist does to the body in practice. Mm. By which I mean I wanted to cut up, I wanted to dissect, I wanted to get to know the phenomenon of demonization. How does it appear? The assumption being that if I can dissect, break down, that we could maybe get a better understanding of some of the functions of how it operates in the body politics and what its implications are. So there are three um, components to what I call the anatomy method in this book. Documenting demonization, in other words, looking for historical contemporary examples of the phenomenon, analyzing it, and then moving on to looking at some of the causes and consequences of that. So that's, um, and that, in some ways, my interest started on demonization um, in a first year paper that I wrote for my undergraduate degree many, many years ago, where I was asked to look at the changing characters of war. And what I found in that paper was, although I was looking for differences, I found a similarity. And I think you can see that from the, from the following slide here, that there was a trend in the complex that I was studying. And I'm not saying that this is a fixed chronology, this is just some examples here. Uh, from the Thirty Years' War, the Napoleonic Wars, the Second World War, and the Cold War, but to show that there is this ongoing thread in battles where the demonic threads itself through conflict, and you see this representation of the one side of the conflict being on the side of good and the other side being on the side of evil. 
And so that, um, uh, out of that, because although they were fought in different periods, totally different protagonists for different reasons, this theme was coming up more and more in the case studies that I was studying. And this forced me to ask myself a very important question. <laughs> so, so I had to dig deep and I had to look at historical cases of uh, this character, the devil. Who was the devil? Where did he come from? Why does he appear in all these contemporary modern conflicts? And what I found in the research through my visual images, of which, as Bob already mentioned, I've de collected many over the years, um, is that they are historical artifacts. They are used to show the images of the time and the belief system sometimes of the people that either painted them or were asked or commissioned to write them. So what I want to explain in this slide is the chronology and the progression that happened in the visual images that I was seeing in the next four slides. What you can just kind of briefly want to say here is that in the first images, the, 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 there were two characteristic features. They were faithful to religious texts. So usually the images, as you can see from the first one, I'll just do that one again. Uh, usually the paintings were, were secluded to the monastic world. By that I mean it was mainly with the audience within the, the monastery, and they were faithful to the text. But then we start to see as we move further, and particularly as the imagination of this demonic myth moves in, we start to see it appearing in religious conflicts. The two next slides show, on the one hand, Martin Luther, on the Protestant, so this is a Catholic uh, image, and this one you have the Pope as devil. So you start to see this idea of people trying to use images to make the other side seem evil. And this then develops into what I call the politics of demonization. At some point we start to see modern states, we start to see political adversaries using this weapon of, um, in this case it's the first secessionists in the American Civil War, where they're actually using demonization. Uh, this was a, an official commissioned United States government envelope that I found here in the rare books uh, archives here at, at, at Harvard. So this is just to show you the progression. Um, and what I was more interested in, though, is after having documented this, I wanted to look at some of the questions raised around how does this inform political practice um, when waging war and waging peace? And so, as you'll see from the two uh, following statements, um, this is Waging War and Waging Peace is actually the title now. Oh, go back to that one. Okay, that one we've already seen. So let me skip that. Right now. Okay, yeah. So this. Okay, there we go. So, Waging War and Waging <coughs> Peace. Um, is actually the title of a, of a research seminar that I'm currently teaching at uh, UC Davis. But it started as the proposal that I had in my book around, as you can see from the two quotes, try to think about how demonization operates in these two different theaters, war making and peacemaking. And so when it comes to waging war, it's pretty well documented in the literature. Uh, I did a survey in the book <coughs> around what some of the main implications of demonization uh, what scholars have considered. And what I do is I try and kind of categorize it into four main, four main um, uh, functions, as I call them, to demonization in warfare. The first is that chasing demons abroad can prompt unity, can prompt unity as people tend to unite behind uh, a common enemy. And research in social psychology has shown that a hostile image of the outgroup will tend to increase in-group solidarity. Um, but demonization threat also inspires a need for protection. Uh, and an authority might use that hostile image to enhance its public legitimacy. There's also a, an element of demonizing the enemy that justifies reprehensible acts against others. Um, so when a conflict is presented as absolute in terms of good and evil, it indicates a clear division between right and wrong. Uh, from this logic, I would say, comes this legitimizing principle of self-righteousness. 
By that I mean that in our perception, any violence that's conducted by the other side, the evil, is immoral. But any acts of violence that we do is perceived as necessary and legitimate. And so acts of violence become dissociated from, from morality. And we are uh, good or bad or right or wrong because of who we are, not because of what we do. Um, so in terms of political and military mobilization, here the idea is that the more frightful the enemy, the more committed the cause and the more committed the soldiers and the public is to the war um, or the conflict. So if dehumanizing the enemy is a strategy that fuels a sense of vert, um, uh, sorry, if dehumanizing the enemy is a strategy that <coughs> enables the soldier to feel a sense of, um, to, re to remove a sense of guilt on the battlefield, then demonization might fuel them with a sense of virtue in the act of killing. Uh, and for these reasons, demonization and war share an intimate relationship. <coughs> but what I was particularly interested in and my research here at PON was examining what I consider a less, less studied phenomenon, which is how does de demonization operate in the theater of war? When we come to that stage, and uh, uh, Bob Mnookin's work on bargaining with the devil was incredibly influential for me here. When we come to this idea of shaking hands with the devil, um, so usually when we frame the conflict as that, it develops a rejectionist principle, right? You don't shake hands with the devil. You risk, uh, you know, negotiating with evil is wrong, and you risk polluting your integrity and your soul. So framing it like that, um, as you can see here, the example of Blair and Jerry Adams, um, the, uh, was portrayed by a <coughs> cartoonist, who's trying to pick up the skepticism around this agreement when it was made at the time. Um, so, and I think Guy-Olivier Faure articulated this very nicely when he said, escalation of images may elicit a deadlock. This is particularly true if the other side is demonized, which prevents a negotiator from making <coughs> any additional concessions so as not to be seen as compromising with the devil. And so what I did in my work was I um, divided it, I kind of created a framework for trying to better understand how demonization might come to inform the peace process, the peace negotiations. And um, what I did is I divided it into what I call three dimensions of demonization deadlock. The first dimension is what I call the nip in the bud. In other words, here the idea is demonizing the enemy might prevent any dialogue from happening in the first place because the idea of negotiating with evil um, is considered wrong. So it's evil has to be vanquished, you don't negotiate with it. And therefore it just cuts the negotiations uh, um, from the bud. The second realm uh, dimension tries to explain how demonization might come to influence uh, ongoing negotiations that have happened in the sense that it creates, it fosters an image of the peace partner as a dishonest broker. And so it delegitimizes this and brings this idea of lack of trust um, that decreases the prospects of a, that risks decreasing the, the prospects of a successful negotiation. And then finally, this third dimension was about with us or against us, a narrative that we became familiar with in the post 9-11 era. But the idea here is that there is no such thing as neutrality in a battle of good and evil. And that framing makes it a problem when it comes to third party negotiations. Because how do third parties remain neutral in a negotiation uh, when it's framed as a battle of good and evil? So this sets up the theoretical part of the presentation. And now the second part, I want to move in to the case study. And as you see with Israel-Palestine, it's had its fair share of demons. Um, and. Um, I explore this phenomenon in three chapters in the book. Um, it's a central case study, firstly because I wanted to choose a single case study to really, really get to know this phenomenon well. And um, like I say, the conflict lent itself well. It's the most intractable conflict of the 20th and the 21st century. So I was able to study the narrative over a longer period of time. And also, it's a conflict that's had several <coughs> peace processes that have failed. So that was interesting from a diplomatic deadlock perspective as well. 
Um, and like you can see from the quote here, reflecting in 1988 on the hope for peace between Israelis and Palestinians, the African-American civil rights activist and Baptist Jesse Jackson um, articulated or summarized the challenges of the conflict as follows. You know, 40 years of conflict have shard not only the land but the spirit. Each side has made the other a demon. No pact can be made with the devil. Conflict has become an accustomed visitor, peace a stranger. So um, as for kind of part of this process of documenting this anatomy method that I was talking about, in chapter five of the book, I set out to document demonization by asking the question, who demonizes whom, when and how? And um, I want to say here that I limited this to 170, 107 quotes. So they're illustrative examples of demonization. Just to give me a prima facie sense of the narrative, of elite narrative in particular. I'll, I'll go into that later and explain. But here's a wordle that I made of some of the key terms that came up in the statements that I uh, will explain uh, to you shortly. As for the sources, uh, I took them from, there are three main source categories. Um, <coughs> government sources, which would include, um, like I said, I was focusing exclusively on elites. So uh, these included government figures, religious figures, and non-government figures. But it would include, for example, policymakers' speeches or their press releases to the public or transcripts from <coughs> public interviews. In the media, it, I was looking particularly for elite broadcasts or if elites, political elites, wrote op-eds in newspapers, I would use them. Um, or in non-governmental sources, I was particularly studying media watchdogs and non-profit organizations that track insight. Uh, so here are some, here's a wordle of kind of some of the main uh, sources that I used to collect uh, the quotes. Uh, the selection criteria that I used is uh, statements had to be by elite. So uh, that meant excluding a certain like public opinion in blogs, network. And I think this is a fascinating avenue for future research, definitely worth studying. But I wanted to look at political elites. Um, so I excluded them for this study. Uh, they had to be by official Israelis and Palestinians, so I had to exclude any statements made by other um, countries. And they had to be directed towards Palestinians or Israelis. So that in involved removing any anti-Jordanian or Iraqi or Iranian comments. So that was kind of the selection process that I had. And here are some of the findings that um, I came across in, this, um, in these examples that I looked at. So like I said, the government uh, figures, religious figures, uh, non-governmental figures, demonization narratives, they exist across the political spectrum. But I found two interesting trends, is that on the Israeli side, there were more demonizing statements from, um, uh, from right-wing affiliated <laughs> parties than left-wing affiliated parties. And that is, to a large extent, consistent with research on the effects of party affiliation of Israelis um, towards the attitudes of the conflict and the peace process, which typically shows that right-wing leaders have more hostile attitudes towards Palestinians than, than left-wing. Um, and the second thing was that, again, religious affiliated parties on both sides were likely to use literal demonizing terms, like devil and e a demon, Satan, um, but Hamas, in particular, would use more extreme and literal language than Fatah. And even just a simple look at the, the, the national charter of the PLO doesn't actually contain the term evil. But the Hamas charter has the term appears seven times. So, as you can see, there was kind of a distinct kind of agenda on, on, the, on the part of Hamas um, party as well, that they had more uh, terms uh, in terms of demonizing terms. So turning, turning to the targets then, who are they demonizing? So if we look at the categories on the Israeli side, um, um, I explain more about these in the book, but here are some examples that I've tried to just visualize for the chart. They are PLO, Arafat, Palestinians, Arabs, <coughs> terrorists, and unspecific. In some cases, there would be kind of references, but they were unclear and ambiguous. But I'll show you more or less what the figures, I'll show you a distribution later. But before that, here's the Palestinian targets. So in other <coughs> words, what's interesting here is that there's a broader range, as you can see, from the sample that I looked at. Uh, but again, references either made to the state, to official figures, to citizens, to the ethnicity, to Jews. So there was a variation 
Um, when we compare the categories to each other, uh, as you can see uh, on the Israeli side, terrorists is the main target of the term. So when the term Satan, evil, devil appears, it's usually in the context of a terrorist attack or defining or describing a terrorist. Um, on, the Isra on the Palestinian side, it's a little bit more distributed um, across, but Zionism in Israel kind of stood out a little bit more than the others from the examples that I looked at. Um, I think also here it's worth noting what's interesting that what's not there. And what didn't show up in the categories on the Israeli side was the term Palestine. And what didn't show up on the, uh, or, and what showed up more frequently, for example, in Hamas statements was the term Zionist entity as opposed to Israel. And those kind of to illustrate this idea of non-recognition in general, right? So kind of the terms that are not there or not present might say something as well in this. Um, and there's definitely a relationship, I would say, between these targets and the context. I found when I was looking at these quotes that, in particular, Palestinian demonization of Israelis, it has to be understood in the context of the experiences of occupation and colonialism. And statements would appear, as I said, in usually in some sort of context of settlement activities, military incursions, house demolitions. In that sense, you have to contextualize Palestinian demonization as an expression of anti-colonial anti-Zionist and anti-occupationalist <coughs> sentiments. Uh, on, the Palestine, on the Israeli side, oh no, sorry. And I think this quote is quite telling of that. So I take this as the state of Israel lives like a demon that takes possession of another body. The state of Israel lives within the Palestinian body, in the Palestinian land, in the Palestinian cities. And so this idea here is of this demon that's taking over, but it's using the metaphor of a demon to show occupation, to show this idea of being, being taken over. Uh, in the uh, Israeli context, the demonization, like I've mentioned before, occurs largely in the context of suicide attacks, mortar attacks, a lot of them in the Second Intifada. Um, so terrorism and security concerns are really important to the narrative of the Israeli side. Um, and again, here, just a quote to illustrate this. This is Ariel Sharon, note after September 11th. So the term axis of evil appears. Uh, we are in the middle of a war, a cruel war, a coalition of terror. So there's this idea of encirclement. There's this idea of um, security concerns that's distinct in the Israeli narrative uh, as well. The main take home from this is that by anatomizing the different contexts of Israel and Palestine, I found that the same speech act of demonization was used to explain different evil experiences and realities in the same conflict. So um, looking at the demonizing messages then, mm -hmm. these were kind of the themes that would come up in the, in the, when I looked at what are they actually saying in the quotes in terms of the message. Um, and there, in terms of the distribution here of the Israeli and the Palestinian, you can see here um, dis destruction is definitely a large part of the narrative. This idea of um, violence, destruction. What's interesting though also is um, there's more, again, distribution on the Palestinian side. And um, this term here of um, domination uh, is not present on the Israeli side but the Palestinian side, which speaks again to this idea of being dominated, this unequal power asymmetry that they identify. Um, this slide here is, was tremendously hard to put together because it's basically put the longest chapter in my book onto one table. Uh, <laughs> but I tried to do that because I wanted to show um, that, um, I wanted to explore how demonization in other words, complicates the negotiations by applying the demonization deadlock framework that I had created and applying it to a long period of study. Um, I've divided it into four phases. Um, the chapter basically explores how demonization is one factor among many, I have to say that, uh, that complicates the negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. So I'm not claiming in the book that demonization is the barrier, it's a barrier, it's not the barrier. But, um, and so 
I think it's important to recognize that it's a conflict that also has structural factors, power asymmetries, refugee rights, security needs, distribution of resources and territory and division of Jerusalem. All these questions are substantial issues and they have received a lot of attention and research. Uh, but relatively little emphasis has been focused on relational barriers in the sense these are substantial barriers. Demonization is more a psychological relational barrier and so I chose to focus on that. Now in the four periods what we see in the pre-Oslo, kind of to quickly run you through it, is this nip in the bud, a narrative of deception. And I think two examples that illustrate that is the PLO charter in 1964. Uh, this idea of rejecting to <coughs> negotiate with Israel at all because it didn't recognize its existence, right, is an example of nip in the bud. But also, Ishak Shamir in 1989 on the Israeli side suggested when he was asked about contact, you know, negotiating with PLO, he said, quote, I'm ready to speak to anyone, even Satan himself, but not with the PLO. <laughs> <laughs> so here again, there's this idea of no negotiations, nip in the bud. Um, in the Oslo phase, there's a changing narrative that begins. It's called, the, I call it the honeymoon phase. I adopted that term from Nabil Shat in an interview with him. He was explaining how the atmosphere changed um, around uh, the perceptions of Israeli and Palestinian negotiators around Oslo. But what's interesting when I was studying this period is this distinct narrative of shaking hands with the devil would appear um, as an allegation. And so here we start to see some interesting intra-demonization between Palestinians, between Israel, as this betrayal. How could you shake hands with the devil? So this language was appearing in the conflict and was corrosive uh, and we saw it particularly as examples here with the demonization of Rabin, but also the demonization of Arafat. Um, so in the post-Oslo phase, we start to see the beginning again of this no partner for peace framework again. Uh, and it emerges, of course, in between the ongoing conflict where we're seeing a rise of suicide bombings <coughs> and a rise of um, settlements and the relationship between them. As like one of the interviewees that I'll mention in the next slide said, you know, bombs exploded settlements and settlements exploded bombs, right? And so in this phase, we start to see the partnership collapse and with it, the language uh, changes. Um, Arafat claims that the settlements, quote, demons have swallowed up everything. He uses the analogy of the demon again. Um, and so as for the final, Sorry, and the final one then, what's interesting again, <coughs> post 9-11-ish, we start to see this with us or against us framework of um, um, uh, biased kind of partisan negotiations and a return to what was previously the nip in the bud. And so here are some of the consequences. Again, it's one table for one chapter, very challenging to put together, but it's just to give you an <coughs> idea. I do recommend, um, it's one of the chapters that was hardest work to put together. Um, it's also the chapter that includes a lot of the information uh, from the interviews that I did. Uh, for the research of the book, I conducted uh, personal interviews with Israeli and Palestinian negotiators. I was actually in Ramallah on the day that I received the email from PON saying that I had successfully gotten the fellowship. So that was, um, I remember that moment very well. Um, but also, my aim of the interviews was to really get a first-hand knowledge of those who had participated in negotiations, what their views and their understandings of the perceptions and the attitudes that existed uh, between uh, the parties in the peace talks, or those who had observed it. Some of them were, were, were scholars. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the interviews. Um, you can read about them in the book. Um, but I will say that for me personally, this was also a very rewarding part of my research, to talk to those who are actually on the ground um, and who do um, the negotiating. So to end this talk, um, well, I always see the end as the new beginning. So in this last slide, I just briefly want to talk about some of the new avenues for future research that I mention in the book. Uh, and that I'm kind of currently conceptualizing is kind of opening up this study of demonization more broadly to look at um, other cases 
So one case that I'm very fascinated by is the China-Tibet conflict. And to try and look at the dynamics, how does the language, for example, change in a different religious or in some cases secular context? How does the devil, demon, evil analogy uh, um, I mentioned some examples in the book of demonization in, in the China-Tibet case, but former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, any conflict can lend itself to studying demonization, and I think it would be interesting to compare them as well. So like I said here, uh, do, does it vary across religion, culture, races? Um, Shia versus Sunni, how does the language appear in that conflict? Uh, the, the racial demonization during the Second World War with the Japanese framed as the yellow devil. Right? So there are a lot of examples that I think could lend themselves very nicely to be um, compared. Another thing is to look at the variation of what I call the audience question. Does and how does demonization change when we relate to different audiences? Right? Um, will I speak the same way about the enemy in one context compared to the other? And that's where this study of comparing <coughs> elites but looking at their private versus their public rhetoric to see uh, if there's any changes as well, I think could be very interesting. Because it would ask, or hopefully answer some of these questions about, is demonization instrumental? Do we just use it because we want to get something? Or is there something deeper, something more normative to it? And then finally, think about exploring some of the paths to de-demonization. And um, we were just talking about this coming down the elevator, about, about um, you know Northern Ireland, uh, now, currently, in, with Colombia and the FARC, um, America and Cuba, these kind of detente or rapprochement periods, what happens in them language-wise? And kind of trying to understand de-demonization as, in some ways, what I call in the book, the exorcism of international politics. So, um, with that, I'd just like to thank um, you all for your time and your attention, to thank PON for hosting this event and also, yeah, thank you all.